from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Acting Librarian of Congress, David S. Mao, um, I'm uh, pleased to be here to introduce Joanne Jenkins. I'm Robert Newland, uh, Chief of Staff for the Library of Congress, and it's so wonderful to see so many people here today in this beautiful, beautiful room. Joanne Jenkins is no stranger to the Library of Congress, and we are a better place because of her. As the Library's Chief of Staff, Joanne was a disruptor, and <laughs> I, I don't mean making a lot of noise in the reading rooms. <laughs> but in her 15 years here, she changed the way the nation interacts with its library. Among her many special contributions, she led the bicentennial celebrations of the library. She led and grew the National Book Festival, the nation's premier celebration of literacy and reading. She re-energized the Junior Fellows Program, which gives talented college students um, internships at the library. She spearheaded the Young Reader Center to provide a special place at the library for young children and their families. She designed an award-winning, state-of-the-art new experience for visitors to the library. She launched an innovative upward mobility and health-related programs for staff. And she integrated the library's unique facility in Culpeper, Virginia, housing the nation's film, television, radio, and sound recording heritage into the Culpeper community. Joanne left the library in 2010 to become president of the AARP Foundation, AARP's charitable arm. As president of the foundation, Joanne transformed that organization's far-reaching development and social impact initiatives, including the Drive to End Hunger, a national, a national effort to help millions of older Americans who struggle with hunger every day. Under her leadership, the foundation's overall donor base increased by 90% over two years. She was appointed Chief Operating Officer in 2013 and Chief Executive Officer of the 38 million member organization in September of 2014. We are very proud to count AARP among our esteemed private sector partners who are instrumental in advancing the library's mission. With her track record for making a difference, it comes as no surprise to me that she finally decided to write down her thoughts on disruption. <laughs> uh, I am particularly interested in how she is disrupt disrupting the aging paradigm because it directly affects me. Uh, in fact, whether you are of the age, guilty, or are dealing with parents or friends that um, that are, I suspect that everyone here today will learn something they can apply in, to improve their quality of life. I do have just one bone to pick with you, Joanne. How is it that since you have become the spokesperson for changing the air aging paradigm, how is it that you never age? <laughs> you know, many years later, here I am with this white hair. What can I say? It's a great pleasure to welcome Joanne back to the library to tell us how she is launching a national movement to disrupt aging. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, and thank you all for coming out to, uh, to talk about disrupt aging uh, today. As we were waiting over in the ceremonial offices, uh, office, one of my favorite place, I told my colleagues from AARP, don't touch anything because if you come in this room, you have to give a million dollars. So I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to make sure. So when they said, do you want water? We said, no, we don't, we, we don't want anything. But thank you uh, all today and thank you, Robert, for uh, sort of going through that uh, 
list of projects that really have so much meaning in my life. And as I was saying, I, I had the good fortune last week to be in New York for the Women of the World Conference, and uh, Laura Bush was there with us, and we were reminiscing about the National Book Festival with John and Sue and so many of uh, all of you who worked on the National Book Festival. And I recalled saying to her, do you remember our first meeting? And I asked you, what would success look like? And she said, if we could get 5,000 people, that would be great. Uh, and we, we, we all have a different answer to how many showed up on that first book festival. It sort of goes anywhere from 15,000 people to 30,000, but we're certainly above the 5,000 that she started. So uh, good to be back here. I want to start today by uh, having a conversation with you about Disrupt Aging, which is our new book that we just uh, put out uh, two weeks ago. <clears throat> Uh, and why it's so important, uh, this whole idea of age disruption and what it is we do. Uh, so the first really uh, idea around this is that the way people are aging is changing. That 50 today is very different than it was years ago. Uh, whether you're 50 or 60 or 70, uh, that it looks very different than it did for our parents or our parents' parents. And that today, with increased longevity and uh, generally better health and medical advances, that we're going to live another 20 or 30 years longer than our parents or grandparents lived. And as a result of that, uh, people are living much longer. The fastest growing age group in this country is people over the age of 85. And the second is people over the age of 100. 10,000 people a day are turning age 65, and that's going to happen every day for the next 14 years. We are getting older, uh, but our focus is really not about how you're going to age, but how you're going to live. <clears throat> so uh, when people say, so why did you write Disrupt Aging? It actually, I would say, has its beginnings here at the Library of Congress, because when I turned 50, my colleague David Albee, who is uh, with me at AARP, uh, him and my husband cooked up this idea that they were going to have a surprise 50th birthday party, and it's actually the introduction to the book. Uh, and those of you who have worked with me know that I don't like secrets. I like to know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and why it's going to happen. And so my husband uh, decided he was taking me to brunch. We got there, there were no reservations, or they had lost the reservations. We had a table back by the kitchen, uh, and I was getting angrier and angrier. And then the maitre d' came back and said, actually, I made a mistake, you're in a different room. And I go over, and it was all of my colleagues from the Library of Congress celebrating my 50th birthday. Uh, but as the story goes, it was about those birthday cards of congratulations, you're 50, you're over the hill. Uh, you know, you're not getting older, you're just forgetting where you put things and, you know, all of those different uh, stereotypes that we see. Uh, so it was that idea and that concept about where I was in my own life uh, and how important I thought it was for us to feel good about being 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or whatever that number is. Uh, and this whole idea about creating the book around disrupt aging was really to start a movement in this country about how do we change the conversation in this country about what it means to be 50 and older? And how do we focus on positive aging and positive living than looking at it as something to fear? Uh, I find it fascinating that as we go around uh, the country talking to uh, folks, that we really see this aha moment of, I feel just like that. I'm so glad you're saying it. Now I can say it and sort of repeat it. Uh, but how do we begin to disrupt aging? Uh, what we're trying to do is to challenge outdated beliefs and spark solutions so that more people can live and choose how they want to age. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's about challenging outdated beliefs and sparking new ideas, uh, that we are creating both a widespread awareness about outdated beliefs and also trying to engage and ignite this conversation and get the private sectors and the public sectors involved about how we need to create new products and new solutions that allow people to live and age uh, better. So let's begin, if I could, around challenging these outdated beliefs. 
one of the, the important things I think it is, is, is really with owning your own age. I tell everybody I meet that uh, I'm 58. Uh, I was born in the year that AARP's founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Anders, started AARP. And so ironically, I'm the first permanent woman to be the CEO in our 58 here history and, and, and very proud of that. Uh, but it is about this whole idea that you see in television and uh, ad magazine commercials that 50 is the new 30. I, I say 50 is not the new 30 and 60 is not the new 40. 50 is the new 50, and it looks good. And it's okay to, to own your age and feel good about where you are and what it is you want to do in your 50 plus life. If you go to the Google search bar uh, and you type in a, a word, I lied about my, the first thing that pops up is age. <clears throat> Why do we do this? How many of you have lied about your eight? You don't have to answer that. Uh, you know, but it's this whole idea that society thinks that younger is better. And so for me, in owning your age and feeling good about where you are, that it's about thinking through and being comfortable with the experiences that life has brought you, uh, that for me, I know that I am a more purposeful person because of the experiences, the wisdom that uh, these years have brought me, and that uh, we're not getting old, younger every day. Uh, we're aging every day from the day we're born, and that we need to own that reality and feel good about it and not let us that hold us back as we're thinking about what it is we want to do in these extra years that are, are coming to us. <clears throat> the second part of this is about fighting ageism, not age. And there is a big distinction. Uh, our ability to live longer and healthier, more productive lives is, is really one of mankind's greatest accomplishments, yet we don't often see it that way, and, and certainly society doesn't see it that way. And these negative stereotypes of aging are so ingrained in our psyche that they're difficult to overcome, and we don't even try at times. And so this whole idea of how do we fight ageism, how do we call it out, not in a hateful way, but in a very direct way when you do it yourself, so when you see one of your colleagues or family members uh, making fun of someone because of their age, or making age your age an excuse for why you can't do something. And so um, that's a, a huge part of how we begin to fight ageism in our own personal lives. I want to show you a, a quick video that, uh, and the people that you're going to see on the video didn't know that they were in this as part of an AARP infomercial. Uh, they thought they were coming to apply for an acting job. Uh, and so we launched this about 10 days ago. So far, 14 million people have viewed it. Hey, how's it going? You can stand right there, that's your mark. How are you doing? I'm great, how are you? Great. Awesome. Just tell us your first name and your age. My real age? <laughs> My name is Paolo, I'm 25 years old. My name is Daniela, and I'm 19. 24. 35. 31. 33. I'm 26 years old. What age do you consider to be old? Late 40s? Maybe 50? <sighs> um... I feel like 30 is a new 20, so I'd say like 40 is old. I'd probably say 50s. I'd like you to show me how an old person would cross the street. I would imagine that having some kind of a cane. How might an old person do a push-up? <coughs> and they probably couldn't get back up. Show me how an old person would send a text message. do a jumping jack. I'm like envisioning grandpa. Grandpa, you're not old, but... <sighs> okay, 
Hang on, there's someone I want you to meet. Hello, I'm Birch. I'm 66. I'm Bob. I'm 65. Hi, I'm Daphne, and I'm 68. I'm Mio, 59. I'm Dee, and I'm 55. George Fassbinder, 75. Wow. My name is Parvati. I'm 70. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're going to give you about two minutes to teach each other something that you are good at. I can teach you a jump that I do. Okay, please. Both of your legs mm -hmm. go up, mm -hmm. and your arm, your right arm goes up, and your left arm goes like to the uh, side. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Lift. One, two, three. And bring it to your heart. And bring it to your heart. Add the head in. Yeah. I'm gonna try to get your balance. And raise up. And now, bring your legs and your feet up. <laughs> it's hard, right? Yeah. One, two, three. So when you switch, you're just pretty much jumping. So it's kind of like this. You can go from here, you can bounce with it. Over. Now forward. Over. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, five, six, seven. So when you come out of a turn, either way, you go back to that basic. So you're going to go back with your right foot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Squirt like this, and give me a hook. Hook. Jab, cross, hook, and then we'll go like this, all right? The nene. The nene, okay. Nene. You're gonna whip it. Whip it, okay. The other side. Here. Drive that bus. All right. Now just wave to the people. Oh, okay, I like that. Wave to the people, okay. Now, what age might you consider to be old? Probably 80 or 90. <laughs> he could just do everything that I told him to do. <laughs> An age that I would consider to be old now might be 100. <laughs> do you remember what you said? Yeah, yeah I said uh, in the 50s I thought that would be old. But when I thought about it, like... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Can I'm I sorry. Now? I can do it. <laughs> it really changed my thinking of what old is. <laughs> You've taught me something today. Clearly, there's no way she's old, you know? Now I know from today, hey, I don't look at age. <laughs> at my age, I feel capable of doing anything because I don't think I'm limited in anything I can do. At my age, I feel like I did when I was in my 20s. At my age, I feel like I'm just getting started. That's just when you put together everything you've learned. There's so many things that I still want to do. There's so many things that I can do. As long as I'm growing and learning, then age doesn't matter. When people start stopping, that's when they start getting old. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Thank Daphne. You. It was great meeting you. <laughs> How long have you been doing this? Is this a new uh, skill? 40 years. <gasps> wow. What I think is so fascinating ab uh, about this video is that one interaction actually changed perception of old uh, aging to these young people. And I also think for the perception of the older uh, people about millennials. And I think that's what we're trying to do with Disrupt Aging, to get people to not judge someone based on how old they are, but on what they can do and what they bring to the table. Uh, if you think about it this way, today it is socially unacceptable to ignore, to ridicule, or stereotype someone based on their gender, their race, or their sexual orientation. Uh, well, I said right before this presidential campaign, that was not acceptable. Uh, uh, so why is it that we still allow people to make fun and tell jokes about someone based on their age? It's part of that cultural norm that we need to dispel so that people are judged based on who they are, not how old they are. Uh, and as I said, that particular video has uh, uh, been viewed over almost 14 million times on Facebook in the last 10 days. So uh, a very powerful uh, exercise in that. <clears throat> uh, Disrupt Aging also focuses around new solutions uh, so that we, as we age, are not having to adapt to what society or uh, 
people from the private sector or products and services that we're not having we're having to adapt to what they put in the market instead of them developing products and services that we need to uh, in the market in order to be able to age well. I focus this around health security, around financial resilience, around personal fulfillment, or my shorthand, health, wealth, and self. How do we start talking about and getting the private sector and communities and you as individuals to focus on those three areas? <clears throat> uh, that whole idea requires changing the way we talk about aging from something to fear to something to look forward to. Uh, in the areas of health, secure, health area. How do we start thinking about health and what we're eating and how we exercise at an early age so that as we uh, get to these additional 20, 30 years that we might live beyond our traditional retirement age, how do we, how do we start focusing on those areas early in life so that our time of decline is drastically condensed? Uh, in the area of the, of the wealth, how do we get people to start saving earlier and saving longer so that they don't outlive their money uh, and that they're not solely dependent on Social Security? And then in the area of self, how do we find that personal fulfillment uh, in our own lives that allow us to be able to do the things that we want to do and to think about what it is we want to do? I love to use the Maya Angelou uh, quote and she says that at 50, we finally become the person we've always wanted to be. And how do we start in our 50 plus years figuring out who is the person that we want to be and how do we go about living our lives? Uh, I certainly like to focus this around what I call the three Ps, the, uh, the uh, personal, private, and public, that we need to take a personal responsibility on how we go about doing this, that there is a public role uh, in our communities uh, around how we address these issues, and that there's a role for the private sector at all levels to start thinking about and creating new solutions for people who are 50 and older that allowed them to live better. Uh, I often talk about the example of the, uh, the car, that why don't we have a seat that swivels out that makes it easier for us to get into the car or makes it easier for the mother trying to put that car seat in to be able to do that. Uh, many of the solutions that we're talking about not only is good for the old, but also good for the young. And how do we stop this pitting against generations, but really getting us to think about solutions that are ageless that allow all of us to live better? Uh, I wanted to just focus, if I could, from these, er these uh, state of uh, how we're moving from to an area, as we said, um, let's go back to the first one, Camille, <clears throat> uh, on health. How do we move from physical and mental diminishment to physical and mental fitness? How do we move from being dependent patients of the healthcare system to empowered users of our health information and how we go about and have conversations with our doctors and hospitals and healthcare providers? How do we move from that uncertain access to care to dependable access to care that we are the ones in the driver's seat to be able to, to do this? And then uh, in the financial areas, uh, older people, viewing older people as economic burdens to older people as economic contributors. People 50 plus contribute $7.1 trillion in economic activity to our country. Uh, and I always like to say that where else but Washington would that be a problem rather than a solution uh, as we're dealing with our, our friends across the street. Uh, that we move from this depletion of finance, finances over time to resources you don't outlive and start thinking about saving for the life I want to live rather than saving for retirement. And how do we start thinking about that at a, at a uh, younger age so that you are making it a part of your uh, daily life? How do we move from an undervalued 50 plus workforce 
to a highly competitive 50 plus workforce, particularly those folks at the Library, uh, uh, at the Library of Congress and libraries all around the world. Uh, if it were not for our volunteers, most of whom are 50 and older, uh, libraries couldn't exist. They couldn't afford to hire the, the workforce uh, that is needed to do uh, the work that librarians do all across this country. And how do we use this 50 plus workforce to help us start solving some of the issues that are fa uh, facing our country? And then in the, in the area of personal fulfillment, how do we start to move from aging is only about decline to aging is about growth? From the fact that aging presents only challenges, that it's an area of opportunity for the 50 plus, but also for the community. And that we start viewing older people uh, not as burdens, but as contributors to society as, as they continue to live some 20 or 30 past what is traditional retirement. And so what I'd like to do uh, is talk about um, what I call the aging's four freedoms, that a new vision for living and aging in America and inspire us to start disrupt aging and making that a reality. On January 6, 1941, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt stood before a joint session of Congress to deliver his annual State of the Union address, and in that speech, he spoke about four freedoms that still ring th true to this day about the basic values that define American life and examples of American exceptionalism. He spoke about the freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And so much like President Roosevelt, we've identified what I call aging's four freedoms. The first one is the, the, the freedom to choose. The freedom to choose how you want to live and age. And when it comes to aging, there is no one size fits all. If you want to follow that traditional path to retirement, you should be able to do that. If you want an active, engaged life and you want to continue working, you should be able to do that as well. If you want to retire and live in a retirement community or live in an institutional setting, you should have the opportunity uh, to make those decisions. And all of those options should be available to you. It's all about having you having the options to decide how you want to live out the rest of your life. The second freedom, the freedom to earn. Uh, a key part of retirement, the retirement model that most of us grew up with, was the freedom from work. That's what retirement was all about, that I was going to go home and not do anything but pay golf and uh, go on vacation. But today, a key part of this extended middle age is the freedom to work. Many of us want or need to continue working in order to subsidize our financial security or the fact that we have a lot more to give back. And I think that's where I found myself when I left the Library of Congress to think that I had the opportunity to retire or go home, or, but I felt like I had a lot more to give. And so I made that choice to, to make that transition over to AARP. But this second freedom is about giving you the opportunity and not letting society decide at a certain age you're no longer able to work to be able to do that. And the third freedom, Freedom to learn, uh, and, and this certainly applies to the work that you guys do here at the Library of Congress, which is the need to keep learning and staying engaged and, and being involved in uh, a productive during this extended middle age that gives you the opportunity to be uh, engaged, to avoid social isolation, uh, to be able to have those learning experiences. You know, I often talk about the idea that we are going to continue learning throughout our lifetime and how important it is for us to stay engaged in a learning environment, to keep up with the use of technology, to be able to stay engaged, whether in libraries or in traditional educational settings, but that we should have the opportunity to continue to learn as we age. And then the fourth freedom, the freedom to pursue happiness, that this is about discovering and fulfilling your purpose in life and really becoming the person that you've always wanted to be uh, 
this extra 20 or 30 years gives us an extraordinary opportunity to become the people that we've always wanted to be, that we're no longer burdened by the many day-to-day -day stresses that consume our lives. Most of our kids are gone off to college or work. Uh, hopefully they're not coming back in but to, uh, but to visit. Uh, but it gives us an extraordinary opportunity to do what it is we want to do uh, as adults and be able to focus on ourselves and on our communities and and, and lived our, our life with meaning and purpose. So in winning these four freedoms, uh, it gives each of, of us an opportunity to really become the person that we want it to be. But I wanna give you this challenge. Um, in conversations with your family and friends, and I've had some of those conversations with you as I've come back here today, uh, and in your work, not only in the library, but, but in your families and communities, how will you start to challenge these outdated beliefs about aging? In your own life and in your work, what solutions will you spark? In everything you do, think about the new possibilities that you can create for yourself and for those around you and in your communities uh, so that we begin this conversation about disrupt aging and not judging people by how old they are, but giving them the opportunity to see the value that you bring back. So we're excited about uh, the book. I'm delighted to be here at, back at the library. I told David when we left the office, let's go home, back over to the library, and everybody at ARP went, ah. Uh, but uh, it's an exciting time for all of us as we think about aging and think about the possibilities. I know that one of the unique uh, things about the work that we do at ARP uh, and the Library of Congress is that both of us have very similar kinds of workplaces. People work at AARP and at the Library of Congress because they believe and love the mission. Uh, it is also one of the places that I know that when I was here at the library, the majority of the employees were over the age of 50. And that if you go down and you talk to Jim Hudson or one of those other curators, uh, they're not thinking about leaving this institution because they have so much to give back. And I think that's what Disrupt Aging is all about. How do we create opportunities and value uh, what people have to give? So thank you all for having me here today. We'll be, I think, available to um, sign books in the Congressional Reading Room. Am I saying too much? Are you gonna do that? So thank you all very much. Joanne, thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot. I loved that video. I was feeling a little verklempt at the end of it. It was so well, so well done. Um, Joanne is, is absolutely right. Uh, we're going to have a reception in the back of the room, and then um, she will be signing books in our congressional reading room next door. So Joanne, thank you so much. So nice to meet your colleagues from AARP today, and um, thank you all for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.